So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this, the second day of the second roundtable on uh, meat and masculinities that we are uh, organizing within DECODEM at uh, SESH. Um, our first session today, um, we have, we're very honored and privileged to have Tina Scanius, which is uh, our international consultant, a uh, very good colleague and, and good friend uh, that is sharing with us her research that she has been undertaking in the last um, years uh, on the Me Too in the, and the journalism coverage on the um, on the Scandinavian countries. And I'm sure you all know Kina work, but um, she's a, an associate professor in the School of Arts and Communication at Malmö University in Sweden. Uh, she holds a PhD in Media and Communication Studies from Lund University, and she has written and published extensively on the relationship between social movements and social media in the context of social justice movements, and more recently also ultranationalist and neo-Nazi movements. Um, and she has also been focusing on the Me Too journalistic coverage uh, in the Scandinavian con context. And that's precisely the topic that she's covering today on her keynote address. Uh, the title is Covering the Me Too Movement in Denmark and Sweden, Juggling Journalistic Ideals and Activist Imperative. Um, so Tina, the floor is yours. And um, whenever there's five minutes left to complete your 20 minutes um, room, um, I'll let you know. Thank you so much, Sophia. And thank you, Julia, and everyone else for, for organizing. Thank you so much for, for this invitation. I wish I was in Coimbra, <laughs> but as I just said to everyone else, I'm in my bedroom. I'm also on a slightly bad internet connection and with three kids downstairs, but I hope this is going to be fine, but we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about this joint project that I've worked on for a couple of years now, actually, with my, um, my good friend and colleague, Jenny Müller Hartley, who's at Roskilde University in Denmark. And we've actually, we've been working on this for, for two years, maybe even a little bit more. Um, and it's a comparative study of the Me Too movement in, in, in Denmark and Sweden, where we're looking at the similarities and differences in how it kind of resonated in those two countries, who at least in, in kind of international literature and, and from an international um, perspective is often kind of just um, um, put into the same kind of basket as nothing that we can have. It, it goes into the Nordic region, but there's actually a lot of kind of differences in terms of how we think about and talk publicly about issues related to gender and gender equality. Um, so we have been looking at this, how the Me Too movement kind of unfolded, how it was reported on, but also what the differences in the broader public debate looked like. Uh, and we thought that we were done. <laughs> we were actually wrapping this up and really kind of ready to put a, um, a full stop to the project. We had our uh, publications out and the last one, the third and final publication is coming out in, in November. So we were really thinking that we were done. But all of a sudden, I'm not sure whether you've been following this or whether that news has kind of um, reached Portugal, but, but now three years later, all of a sudden, Denmark is experiencing this explosion of a second kind of wave of Me Too, uh, a, a kind of Me Too 2.0 um, um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that really wasn't uh, there three years ago. So there is a lot going on right now in Denmark um, and for the past four weeks, we've, we've really kind of, we've, um, we've done almost like nothing but interviews. So all of a sudden this research that we did back then uh, on why wasn't there a movement in Denmark? What, what kind of voices were suppressed? Why didn't people and women in particular want to share their experiences back in 2017? Um, so all of a sudden, all of these questions are being asked and raised. So, um, so it's really kind of, it's, uh, it's hit the public agenda, but also the political agenda in a, in a quite remarkable way. And I hope maybe we can, we can get back to that at the very end of this. So a lot, just to say that a lot is changing right now. And this research that we've done is becoming dated in, in, a, in a good way, in the sense that it now seems that Denmark is having its, its Me Too moment. Um, just to give you a um, kind of sense of what we've done, it's a two-part study because as I said, we wanted to not just capture the, 
the media representations, the, the, the kind of actual coverage, but we also wanted to get a sense of the broader public debate around Me Too. Um, so, so really kind of what we wanted to do was the, the coverage, but also the experience of being part of that coverage. What was it like to be reporting on this or what was it like to be part of the, the kind of um, the public conversation around these issues? Um, so the first part it was a rather kind of traditional uh, content analysis. We started off with a quantitative content analysis of for the biggest dailies in each each country, and then we did a framing analysis on a, sh a smaller sample of this, where we looked at the similarities and differences in terms of both the the main themes, the kind of sources, how were they distributed, um, but also the tone. So the different kind of frames and the different ways in which the, the movement was being legitimized or delegitimized in in the public in in the media. Um, and so in terms of if we just looked at the scope, we, the kind of main finding was obviously that there was a lot more written in Sweden compared to Denmark. I think it was like four times as much media coverage um, uh, compared to Denmark. Um, the sources also look different. There was a lot more, for example, um, politicians and political actors who um, were kind of a given voice in the coverage in Sweden. So in Sweden, we saw a lot of politicians who were publicly kind of uh, in support uh, or even themselves sharing experiences of sexism or sexual harassment. Um, whereas in Denmark, we saw hardly any um, political actors acting as sources in the actual material. We also saw a big difference in terms of the tone of this coverage, the ways in which the, the movement was being framed, um, criticism of the movement, um, even some very kind of very explicit anti-feminist frames in the coverage occurred in both countries, but it was most prevalent in Denmark. Um, There's also a tendency to kind of treat Me Too testimonies, so women's testimonies as these kind of a series of isolated and, and rather kind of personal, personalized accounts rather than a social movement. That was also more uh, prevalent in Denmark compared to Sweden. Um, so that was kind of the main results of, of that first study. And then part two is based on a qualitative interview study um, where we did interviews with not only journalists, but also with activists and other people who in various ways had been involved or engaged in this broader public debate that arised in both countries. And so for, for this part of the study, we're, we're looking more at sort of this specifically kind of the self-perceived roles and experiences of the journalists. Um, and here we also, we, we had, um, we had interviews with people from various, uh, dailies, but also with these, uh, a number of different NGOs and kind of activist organizations who in various ways had been part of that coverage. Uh, and here, this is just to give you a little bit of a, a sense of, of, um, of the outcome, the first part of the project was uh, published in Nordicom Review, which is a Scandinavian media journal where we published the, the framing analysis. And then the, the interview study, the first piece on that is, has just come out in, in journalism practice, uh, a piece where we kind of mainly go into the theoretical framework around role theory in, in journalism studies. Um, this is just to give you kind of a sense of what that difference looked like uh, in the two countries. And so uh, the red is Danish here and the, the blue is Swedish. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm cherry picking a little bit here. This is, these are examples from, from the media or from the articles where men was the author of those articles. And here you can kind of see what a general tendency, but which was perhaps most kind of obvious and most blatant in the articles where, where men was kind of the, the, the author of, of the articles. So in Denmark, we saw a lot of um, arguments like these, um, men saying that Me Too is a feminist kangaroo court, preemptively judges the man, is ignorant to his side of the case, it's emotional, it kind of surmounts uh, central values and principles. It's a lot of talk about how, um, um, how, what kind of, how the man becomes a victim in, in this, how his life is ruined. Um, uh, a lot of um, men who also made the claim that uh, it's really important that we remember that women too can be perpetrators, women use their sexual power, their sexual capital, they're also cynical and shameless and 
the, the whole kind of not all men and uh, women do it too argument was very prevalent in the Danish part of, of, of the coverage where men were the main author. And this was in very kind of stark contrast to the Swedish coverage where we saw uh, arguments like these here um, unfolding um, a, a, a lot more kind of reckoning with with what this kind of moment was inviting them to do. Um, here's a couple of quotes, um, men saying we have to start searching ourselves, we have to acknowledge and, and dare to kind of admit that we're part of the problem. Uh, talks about being complicit, complicity, um, talks about how they have been part of sustaining patriarchy in their silence. Um, and how, in general, kind of Me Too should be a reckoning moment and a rallying cry for men, a kind of a, a moment for them to look inwards and think about what can I do, what can we do, what can we do as a community, but also what can we do as, as men and how can we change kind of the cultures around masculinity and men's culture. So there was a lot more of, of that kind of argumentation going on and we did not see that in the Danish coverage. So those are just a few examples of what it looked like. Um, so um, this issue kind of, um, which I address in this opening quote here, really kind of gets to the heart of how uh, journalists that we interviewed were reflecting on this kind of balancing act between activism and, and journalism and, and how that was a particularly kind of tr tricky thing to do for many journalists during this really intense period where there was so much coverage and so much focus on this issue. And so in the first part of the analysis, in, in the textual analysis, we identified this key theme uh, in the debate around Me Too in, in both countries, but it's particularly prevalent in Sweden, which was this discussion around the role of, of the journalist and of news media in covering, which was then uh, intertwined with all of these accusations, essentially, of journalists becoming activists. And this was something that we saw very early on in Denmark, where immediately after this started happening, um, women who were reporting on this were being accused of being partial and of being kind of uh, activist in their journalistic reporting on it. And a lot of accusations around how, how they couldn't be objective reporters because they had so much invested in this just because they were women. Um, so these, um, these kind of accusations against journalists uh, and against them becoming activists and going too far, getting carried away, not being sufficiently impartial and objective, um, were, were very kind of uh, predominant. And so in this quote, um, this is a respondent who kind of articulate how in those very initial stages in the very first kind of uh, a month in Sweden, there was kind of a turn towards activism and a pressure almost she experienced for journalists to become activists. And this is really something that kind of, again, differs between Denmark and Sweden, um, that the journalists felt that, um, that there was so much positivity, there was so much momentum, and there was so much kind of, of a lively debate going on that, that it was also a little bit hard to take a step back and uh, and not get too carried away in the reporting. And this is her kind of reflecting on that. Um, one of the very kind of concrete uh, ways in which this, these discussions were surfacing was around, there was all of these, uh, in, in Sweden, there were all of these um, uh, calls for action and petitions being signed within different um, kinds of professional, or, um, professional um, organizations. And the media business or the media organizations was one of these and each, each kind of um, a category had its, its own hashtag. And for the journalists and the people working in the media organization, they rallied around and organized petitions around a hashtag called deadline. And so in Sweden, there was a very concrete kind of discussion around whether um, the, those who had all the women journalists who had signed the petition for uh, actions against sexism in the journalism industry, uh, whether they were partial or whether they could, in fact, keep reporting on the movement. So there's a lot of kind of distinctions about that, um, where it, the, the kind of basic rules seem to be that you couldn't, if you were a news journalist, you could no longer report on it. But if you were someone writing for the culture section or the opinion section, then of course you could you could keep doing it. And we're actually seeing this right now in Denmark, which is really interesting because that didn't happen back then, but right now we're having a super interesting discussion in Denmark around this issue of partiality. 
um, because uh, the media workers in Denmark have in thousands and thousands, I mean, in the first couple of weeks after this happened a month ago, we had um, 2,000 signatures in Politiken after, after the first call. Um, and uh, a, a leading kind of male um, uh, editor-in-chief from our main television station went out public and said that every woman who had signed that petition could no longer be part of this debate because they were all partial. Um, so, so again, we're kind of seeing this rehearsed, but in a Danish context. Um, in the Danish context back then, again in, in 2017, um, some of these journalists that we talked to, they really described this as the moment and the movement that they had all been waiting for for a very long time. Uh, but despite the fact that they had been waiting for this, re they were really reluctant to, to get engaged. Um, they didn't want to be accused of being opinionated or being, being partisan uh, when writing about this. So they were kind of seeking to even preemptively address some of the accusations of being activists about the issue by tapping into these frames that were circulating around not all men or uh, men are victims too, just to make sure that they weren't kind of, um, that they weren't perceived as, as being a woman with a cause, a, a radical feminist out to get <laughs> men. So they were kind of preemptively taking in some of these um, anti Me Too frames as part of their coverage in order to kind of cover, cover their own back, you could say. Uh, so that's an, an interesting kind of um, balance going on there. Um, this is uh, a Swedish journalist kind of also reflecting on this balancing act and how she was working very carefully not to even like anything. So she wasn't, she wasn't even liking other people's news stories about me too, because she wanted to be absolutely sure that she wasn't after her. She, this is a journalist who, who wrote a, a very, um, one of the major kind of uh, investigative pieces in Sweden, uh, which ended up having the most impact of all of the stories that were published. She, she was very, very uh, keen on not being considered or conceived of as activists in her reporting. Um, so for her, she was, um, she says that it was really, uh, it was really important to her, but it was also really easy for her to make this distinction because she decided when she knew that she was going to publish this investigative piece, that she had to make those really kind of, uh, she had to really distinguish between the two. There couldn't be any kind of um, uh, crossovers between her personal um, and her professional engagement with this story. She could never mix those roles. Um, and of course, this kind of this balancing act is something which is related to uh, the kind of individual journalists um, um, or to, to the different kind of uh, levels at which these reflections were taking place. So it relates to both the individual journalist, uh, but also to the kind of newsroom cultures and the workspace that they, that they were part of. And then also to, to the kind of broader societal and national context in which they were making these choices and in which they were kind of um, uh, articulating these various kind of reflections around their ideals, around objectivity and over, around the kind of activist imperative. So what we try to do in, in, in the um, published piece on, on, the, um, on the journalism, um, in the journalism practice article, we, we try to kind of um, unfold the analysis in relation to, to these three different levels uh, at which these journalists were articulating how they were trying to, how they were struggling with the, this balancing act and, and these, uh, these decisions that they were making. So for, for the individual journalists, uh, their kind of room for maneuvering and, and working around this and, and kind of negotiating this in relation um, to, to not only the different, the genres, so were they news journalists or cultural journalists and what kind of uh, journalism were they working on, but also in terms of, or in relation to the platform for which they were producing content. Um, so when asked uh, directly, respondents said that the uh, ob objectivity norm to them uh, translated into kind of journalism practice in the newsroom was really kind of synonymous with ideals of, of balanced reporting. So to them, uh, objectivity means you have to be balanced and you have to be fair, right, to the thing that you're covering. And this also was kind of interpreted rather differently in the, in the two national contexts. So the journalists in Denmark argued that um, it was important in cases where men were accused of harassment to also hear their side of the story. 
So there is a kind of a, a two-sidedism uh, going on with the logic being that if a woman, if you have a woman source sharing a story of harassment in some way kind of supporting the movement or being positive towards uh, Me Too, then we also need to have a story or someone on record who is either contradicting her or is kind of negative um, towards the movement. Um, or that the, the premise of the stories that she had shared. So in Denmark, we really saw a lot of coverage, which was this kind of both sidisms. It was never just a woman's story. It had to be balanced out by a man's perspective. So this kind of um, the ideal of objectivity and, and, and a way to, to balance it. In Denmark, this norm of objectivity and impartiality really kind of translated into terms of, of balancing it out uh, with sources, which also means that when we looked at the, the when we looked at this quantitatively, we could see that there were a lot more male sources in the Danish coverage compared to the Swedish coverage. So that was another kind of um, where a kind of place where the two studies kind of over over overlapped. Um, and then so questions around the role that that. Um, journalists perceived as the most kind of appropriate in a, in a given situation um, um, were, were kind of um, negotiated not just at the level of the individual journalist reflecting on this in relation to the kind of the genre and the platform that they're producing content for, but also negotiated in relation to the newsroom culture that that, that journalist is part of um, and in relation to the kind of social dynamics of this space. And a lot of the uh, journalists in the Danish context um, reflected on how the newsroom is a very male dominated space in Denmark and how that was kind of uh, filtering into how they navigate in the newsroom. Um, Sorry, Tina, just to let you know, five minutes. Perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll move really quickly, but just to say that uh, this was kind of how people were reflecting on it and and a lot of people in Denmark were saying to us, well, I mean, the the newsroom where I work is very much just a reflection of what the broader public debate for gender inequality and sexism looks like in Denmark. So in a sense, it's like a microcosm reflecting that larger cosmic cosm. Um, and this is um um this is one of the journalists who were kind of um, that the responsibility is with the woman kind of saturating, saturates everything I find here. And she, she kind of reflects on how that goes for society at large, but also for the for kind of the, the workplace environment that she's part of. Um, finally, we found that uh, journalist experience of Me Too reporting were really kind of contingent upon the broader media cultures and, and the political context or the national context for, for addressing issues around gender inequality more, more generally. Um, so in, in this kind of third level of analysis, we describe and explain these different experiences among the journalists in the two countries in terms of what it meant to, to engage in, in the Me Too uh, movement in relation to these uh, broader and much longer historical uh, debates that, that have been taking place there. So the main kind of difference, I mean, in Sweden, um, the Me Too movement, and this is how um, most journalists describe this, what, what was the main difference between Denmark and Sweden was, was that in, in Me Too kind of tabbed into it, it landed in an already ongoing conversation about gender and gender equality and sexism. Um, it was a conversation which kind of starts with the assumption that even though uh, most male politicians here kind of call themselves a feminist and, and we're well known for having a feminist uh, kind of foreign policy, for example, we're not even cl close to reaching gender equality. And that's kind of the, the basic premise of the conversation that sex, sexism exists, gender equality have not yet been reached. And that's the, the main kind of premise of the conversation. Whereas in Denmark, we seem to start at the other end of the spectrum. Every time something surfaces around issues around gender or gender equality, we start with the conversation of whether we even have a problem around sexism or around gender inequality. So that's a major, I think, kind of difference in terms of where the debate starts and how that starting point kind of takes that conversation in two very different directions. Um, and it's at least kind of part of explaining why, why it ended up so differently back then. 
Um, but I do not have much time left, so I'm just going to end here with this beautiful tummy, <laughs> which is uh, a picture of um, a Sufi Linde, who, as I said, or as I started out saying a month ago, uh, really kind of kicked off a Me Too movement in Denmark, single-handedly, more or less, I would say. Uh, she's a very well-known and a very um, popular media profile who everybody knows, who everybody loves in Denmark. And she went on stage. She was the host of a big uh, comedy gala festival. And she went on stage first showing her uh, pregnant tummy. And then after that, she gave a, a, um, a speech where she um, described in detail a number of very kind of shocking uh, incidents of sexual harassment that she had experienced as a young journalist in our at the heart of our public service um, um, institution, Denmark's radio. And so she's really kind of set things in motion. And we're kind of at a place where, where it started in the media organization, but it's reached kind of the, a, a political level. Um, we have a case now where our, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, who 10 years ago, there was a case where he, or is it like 12 years ago, he had sex with a 15 year old with a political camp. And that case is now, uh, which was closed back then, is now kind of resurfacing. And this is starting to kind of reverberate on the very highest political level. We're seeing our prime minister uh, coming out in defense of the movement and in support of the movement. Uh, uh, um, a party leader of one of our major political parties has stepped down this previous week. So we're really kind of just seeing the beginnings of this in Denmark, and it looks as if things are really changing here uh, in, in a positive way, but also we see a lot of backlash, uh, especially in the past week or so, we're starting to see a lot of backlash against what was, at least in the first couple of weeks, a very kind of uh, solid momentum for the movement. And I'm going to stop here. I think my 20 minutes are up. Thank you. Mm -hmm.